And so prepping for the introduction to the HSPs, I, I got invited a few years back. Let's see, what is the date on this one? 2014. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, by a scientist at Baker Hughes to do a distinguished lecture. So, whoa, that was fancy. Um, I went down to Baker Hughes and he gave a talk on Hansen solubility parameters to their scientists and engineers. And then they simulcast that out to all of Baker Hughes. It, it was at least available to all their employees, which was potentially up to 60,000 employees. So that was a little scary, talking to a room of a couple of hundred people, you know, and then potentially live stream to 60,000 employees. It was probably the largest potential audience I've ever had. So we'll, we'll see, now we're on YouTube, so pretty scary. <laughs> Just got to choose your words wisely. Now I'm presenting the the work that that I did in preparing for that lecture, and that's the introduction to Hansen solubility parameters. So I thought, what better? I've already prepared this for that distinguished lecture, so I'll just give you guys this same lecture, at least my portion of it. I notice that there's partners here, uh, these other fellows from from Solve, who produce a lot of the solvents that Baker Hughes use, uses, and so the Solve consultants know the applications of their solvents in Baker Hughes's product stream. And I was just giving the science background as to the Hansen solubility parameters. So I won't present their work because I don't necessarily have their permission to present it again. But I'll, um, I will uh, at least show you the places where they came in and talked about how temperature works and so on or how Hansen solubility parameters helped in their analysis. So this is the outline. I talked about the theory of molecular viewpoint then they had an application, then I talked about the behavior of liquids, and then they had an application. So let's talk about its relevance. This was an oil and gas company, and so this is their product. So if you go through, they have uh, all kinds of uh, fluids that, in their flow assurance area, get crude from down in the hot reservoir to the surface. Down in the hot reservoir, you have a huge pressure and a huge temperature. At the surface, you have one atmosphere and room temperature, or maybe slightly elevated. But, but the point is there's an enormous pressure change. There's an enormous uh, temperature change. And then you've got it going through a pretty small orifice. And so one of the biggest problems, and <laughs> Matthew can attest to this, is changes in temperature and having things precipitate out reduces the diameter of that pipe. So flow assurance is enormous in terms of the industry making sure that that crude oil doesn't start to precipitate out in the pipe. We learn in PCHEM 2 that flow is a function of the radius of that pipe to the fourth power. That's in the denominator. So, I mean, if, if you really want to flow that, I mean, it's in the numerator. You want to flow more fluid, increase the radius of the pipe. If you double the radius, the flow goes up 16 times. So that's amazing. Um, so they have all kinds of oil field products and I posted this picture because this is on their fracking system so chemistry related to their fracking fluids and that's John Mayer a graduate of our program he got a job at Baker Hughes and he was uh, instrumental in their research on getting away from the environmentally damaging fracking fluids to a more greener alternative in case there's a spill or if in case it gets into a reservoir that we have access to most of this takes place, I mean, almost a mile below the water table. So if the, if the well is cased correctly, and most of them are because they do pressure tests and so on, they cement in the, the production tubing, all of this happens down way below the water reservoir. But still, if something's done improperly, if there's a crack in the casing or something like that, you could have contact of these fluids with the water table. And so getting away from toxic uh, fluids in this production stream is a good idea if you can do it. Um, so this mixtures and dissimilar fluids and interactions happen uh, at the molecular level. So attractions are dealing with molecules and that's where the Hansen solubility parameters really come into play. So let's talk about attractions between molecules. One of the simplest ways to track the attractions of between molecules is their boiling points. And so this is a nice plot. This was actually from the freshman text Brown, LeMay, and Burston, the data. Um, and you can just look at the boiling point series, starting at methane and getting bigger. So we go methane and then silane, we go to silicon, and you can see the molar mass increase. And you see the, the, the boiling point increase. We go down one more period, and now we're at germanium. 
boiling point increased a little bit. Again, a, a slightly bigger molecule. And then 10, bigger molecule, larger boiling point. Now let's jump over two groups into the calcogens, the oxygen group. And now we have an asymmetric molecule. So whenever you have asymmetry, you have the chance for a dipole moment, so a polar molecule. So now we have tellurium. And it's very similar in mass to the tin hydride, but it's got a higher boiling point. So it's not really a mass effect. Something else is going on here. We come down to selenium, sulfur. So we're moving up in the periodic table and we get to sulfur. Again, we see all of these and look at that nice trend. The, the asymmetric molecules are almost always just a little bit higher than the symmetric molecules. So that's not just the molar mass and the size of the molecule, something's going on with the asymmetric molecules. Now, if you were to look at this trend and you didn't know anything about chemistry, but you just like math, okay, and you're an engineer, you look at this and you go, well, <laughs> notice that little dig, sorry, engineers, I said you don't know anything about chemistry. But if you're looking at this, you say, where would water fall? Okay, where, where do you think water would be? It would be right here. Don't you think? But it's not. <laughs> so something is unique about water. And this is a fantastic chart to show that. Just looking at the boiling point. I mean, water should boil by its mass and by its asymmetry, its polarity. It should boil at 100 degrees below zero. That's pretty amazing. So now, I mean, this really illustrates how unbelievably different water is. This increase in boiling point related to the size of the molecule, the size of the electron cloud, because that's really the only difference between these. There's not much, um, um, you know, change here in polarity or any other way. Uh, you see an increase in boiling point based on the dispersion or the number of electrons in the molecule. This is what keeps them condensed in these instantaneous dipole moments. And then you can add in polarity. So these molecules are asymmetric and you have this polarity effect. And then for some molecules, you have the hydrogen bonding. So those are the three types of interactions that we can track uh, very easily with different molecules, whether they have a hydrogen bonding nature to them, whether they're polar or not. And then all molecules have some sort of dispersion or polarizability to their electron cloud. Okay. Uh, other people have called the dispersion the London dispersion forces and others have named it van der Waals interactions. So those are all captured in the same category of dispersion. So when we talk about the dispersion uh, uh, solubility parameter, it's van der Waals forces, it's instantaneous dipoles, London dispersion forces, that's, that's all under that, that D, P, and H, that's the D value. The P value is obviously polarity, and the H is the hydrogen bonding. And stop me if you have questions at any time or want to make sure that your inferences are correct, you can check them. So let's, let's look at what, what it takes to boil. I mean, this is a way to fully disperse those molecules. Uh, and so we have this cohesive energy density. This delta H of vaporization is how much energy you put in, how much heat you put in to get the molecules to be completely apart as in the gas phase. So we're breaking all of these intermolecular attractions with the delta H of vaporization. Now, how much energy do you have in a unit volume? You divide by the volume. So we have the joules per mole divided by the volume per mole. So this is a cohesive energy. The cohesive part is what's holding them together as a liquid. Density is in a particular volume. So this cohesive energy density is a thing. You can classify the different substances based upon this delta H of vaporization per unit volume. And then this molar volume, if you want to know where that comes from, if you know the molar mass and you measure the density of that liquid uh, or the substance, it could be a solid as well, then that's the molar volume, it's the volume per mole. So here we have density in the, in the denominator, which is grams per mil, because you're dividing by a per mil, the mil comes up on top. And so it's a mils per mole. So these are the terms that we're going to be using in describing this uh, Hansen solubility parameter scheme. So let's think about mixing. We take that solute and solvent, or two liquids, and we disperse them, we evaporate them completely. 
And so in this case, we have a solute and a solvent. This is just, again, a picture from uh, the Pearson text, Brown, LeMay, and Burston. This is a salt crystal, so in chloride and water. And so how much energy does it take to disperse the water? That's that delta H of vaporization of water. The NaCl dispersing that would be, I guess, um, the enthalpy of formation of the HCl crystal. And so the free energy of vaporization of the pure species would get us up here to the dispersed solute and solvent. And then we get some energy back by mixing them. So we mix them together and condense them into the mixture. And so that'd be the free energy of vaporization of the mixture. And here we have dispersed chlorine ions and sodium ions in water. And that's going to, because we can have those nice associations of the water with the cations and the anions, it's lower in energy. And so this has a spontaneous negative delta G of mixing. The entropy is always positive in these cases. Well, and the ions actually, we won't get into the entropy. The, the delta G is, is negative in this case, so it's spontaneous to mix. And so we can look at this heat of mixing. It's a comparison of that dispersal of the pure substances to the condensation of the mixture. And so this is where that first solubility parameter comes in. Hildebrand kind of paved the way and coined the term solubility parameter. And he was looking at the solubility of substances in the hydrocarbons. So the hydrocarbons are nonpolar, and the hydrocarbons don't hydrogen bond. And so his theory worked really well at predicting solubility in hexane or decane or dodecane or even pentane and so on. So he was working only on the hydrocarbon axis, uh, the dispersion axis, which we'll see later. And, and so he came up with this solubility parameter. And he likened it to the, or he compared it to the delta H of vaporization per molar volume or the cohesive energy density. And, and so essentially that cohesive energy density is equal to this solubility parameter squared. Now, if you take the delta H of mixing, it's equal to the, the, the uh, volume fraction of each of the solvents times the total volume. And then you have this comparison of the, of the uh, solubility parameters of substance one and substance two. Now, I've color coded these uh, because the, the red ones are the dispersal of the pure solvent and the pure solute. So substance one might be the solute, substance two might be the, the solvent. And so you're dispersing those that has, they have cohesive energy densities. Remember that the, the delta squared is the cohesive energy density. So that's how much energy it takes to disperse the solute and disperse the solvent. And then when you want to condense the mixture, that's the green term, condensation of the mixed solvent and solute are the, the solubility parameters multiplied by each other one times two. And so if those are very similar, you get a large negative term. If they're very different, you have a tiny little term times a large term, and that's a smaller number than if you had two similar values multiplied by each other. And so this delta H of mixing is uh, related to the volume fractions times each other, the total volume, and then the difference in these cohesive energy density terms for the pure substances. Notice this is nice. What is nice about this? Let's try to get your mind thinking about this instead of just looking at the equations. What do you see in, in this delta H term that is useful in dealing with mixtures? Yeah, the same amounts of both A and B do have the biggest um, change. Okay, very good. So yeah, if, if, v, if phi one, phi is the, the, um, the volume fraction. And so if you have phi one times phi two, both of those are less than one. And so if you had like a 0.5 times a 0 0.5, that would be a larger enthalpy value than, than anything less than that in either direction. You're dealing with known terms, or, or experimentally known, possibly known terms about the pure. Okay, but you might, let's, let me push back on that just a little bit, so you might not know one of these, okay? But there's, there's something really valuable in this equation, and, and it's related to the delta 1 and delta 2s, okay? Well, one thing you can see is if, um, if the difference is small, what do you get? Very small. Yeah, so the delta H is what poisons the whole stew. 
right? Because it's delta G is plus delta H minus T delta S. So the delta H, if it's very positive, you won't have mixing. So we can look at this and say if my solubility parameters are close to each other, then let's say they're equal, delta H of mixing is zero. So if my solubility parameters are equal, then delta H of mixing is zero, and it's going to be spontaneous to mix them. But let's think about the one and two. You said they're known. Yes, let's say that they are known. Notice how, uh, let's say hexane's solubility parameter doesn't depend upon anything it's mixed with. The solubility parameter is a, is a parameter for hexane, and the solubility parameter for water is a parameter for water. And that's different than these Henry's Law constants. Remember the Henry's Law constant was a real problem because for hexane and water, you had two Henry's Law constants. And then, I, then acetone and water, you had two different Henry's Law constants. So here I have, I have, in that case, two mixtures, and I have four constants. I have a Henry's Law constant for water and hexane, water in acetone, and then I have a Henry's Law constant for acetone and water, acetone, and, and hexane and water. So I have four Henry's Law constants for two mixtures. Here I have, in those cases, two mixtures and only two uh, solubility parameters. Solubility parameter for water is, is an inherent to water because it's, look up above, it's the cohesive energy density of water. And the, the solubility parameter for hexane is just the cohesive energy density for hexane. So it doesn't matter what I mix it with. Now that might be a reason this, this theory might, that's an assumption, right? That, that might break down. But at this point, it holds pretty well. That if we know what water does, then we can predict what water will do in any of these other mixtures. And if we know what hexane does, we know what it will do in these different mixtures. So that's a really fantastic theory. That's, that's way better than Henry's Law. Henry's Law is a mess because every binary mixture has two Henry's Law constants associated with it. So will these substances mix? So negative change in chemical potential we have a spontaneous entropy because all of those um, fractions, those volume fractions, are less than one. So all the negative, all the logs are negative, and so then that cancels the negative sign and gives us a positive entropy for mixing. The delta H of mixing in this particular situation is always going to be positive, so it's always going to go against mixing. Again, this theory is made to to look for those cases where you have phase separation and you don't have mixing. Uh, there may be examples where you have a negative delta H, but that's going to be even more spontaneous. So this is really a theory geared towards the difficult cases where you don't have mixing, where you have precipitation or phase separation. And so in our, our spontane spontaneity, our Gibbs energy, you have that, that positive or zero delta H of mixing, and then you have a, a, a positive entropy of mixing, which because of the equation favors uh, spontaneity. It's a negative term. So if enthalpy is big, raise the temperature. Because <laughs> it's a battle between that T delta S term and the enthalpy term. And that makes sense, right? If it's a, it takes energy to mix these substances, raise the temperature. And you put more, entro in, you put more energy in the system and you're, you're helping entropy take over. Entropy favors mixing. And so if you really want to drive something into solution, uh, you know, they say oil and water don't mix, and I say at what temperature? Right? <laughs> you might find a temperature which oil and water mix, like maybe down in the formation. It might be a high enough temperature, high enough pressure where oil and water are dispersed in each other. They start coming up the pipe, and they hit a cold brine area, and they salt out, and, and the water separates from the oil, and you've got a problem. So then they get into the applications, and... Uh, uh, Amit and Charles talked about temperature solving some of their problems and then I come back with the theory so so we've ended with this slide uh, and I want to focus on this enthalpy change this Hansen solubility parameter piece so what contributes to large delta H's of mixing the differences in those solubility parameters Hildebrand which is that delta T the Hildebrand parameter he focused only on the hydrocarbons and so because he was focusing on the hydrocarbons, he had no polar term and he had no hydrogen bonding term. 
And so Hansen came along and he was studying in his thesis in the 60s, studying polymer solubility. Well, think about polymers. I mean, you've got ester groups, you've got, you've got hydrocarbon polymers, polyethylene, polypropylene, but you also have things like polystyrene. It's a hydrocarbon polymer, but it's got that aromatic ring on there. And it gives you a little bit of asymmetry, a little bit of polar character, and it can receive a hydrogen bond. You can aim a hydrogen at that ring. Okay, so it's a little bit, not much, a little bit of hydrogen bonding character for its polystyrene. But you get to polyester, you know, those ester groups, polyamides, proteins, all kinds of different polymers, and he needed to predict their solubility. So he broke the Hildebrand parameter into hydrogen bonding, polarity, and dispersion. So every substance has these three subsets of solubility parameters. Delta D, delta P, and delta H. And a lot of times I just leave the deltas off in my language and call them DPH. So those are interchangeable. If you see DPH in any of my slides, it's just because the you know, Greek character delta is hard to deal with in some software. I don't have hotkeys for it in PowerPoint and so on. And so it's just DPH means delta D, delta P, and delta H. And so this is how they're related to the Hildebrand solubility parameter. That delta T total uh, is the sum of the squares of the others. And so now that we have three parameters, this is very nice to plot in three dimensions. And so you can set up this three-dimensional plot, and you can put the solvents as points in this plot on the d-axis, the p-axis, and the h-axis. So going from right to left, that's the d-axis. Going from forward to back, that's the p-axis, and going up is the h-axis. Now, why I plot it this way, I couldn't tell you, except that as I was dealing with this thing and rotating it around, this was the view that was most comfortable for me, okay? So the origin is actually close to you, and D is going to, the, to your left, and P is going back into the screen, and H is going up, okay? So it's kind of looking like that, or like that. Yeah, so look at water. Water is way up there. It has an H value of 42, okay? And, and that's another thing, the, the units on these uh, we'll get to in a second, but but it's equivalent to like kilograms per liter, or kilojoules per liter. So it's the, it's the amount of energy per volume. So kilojoules per liter is, are, are these solubility parameters in terms of their energy density. Uh, that would be for the value squared. Okay. And so uh, in this figure too, I've taken D, P, and H, and D is blue, P is red, and, and H is green. And I went ahead and mixed them as if those were RGB values. So red, green, blue, and I colored the dots associated with that. So this is my colleagues, uh, uh, Barbara and Ed Koenigsberg, who uh, uh, consulting firm, D, uh, BFK Solutions, they talk about this like mixing paint, you know, it colors in paint. So she sees the DP and H values as red, green, and blue. And if, if they're similar uh, paints, they'll mix well and the color will be nice in, in between the two colors. Um, if they're dissimilar in, in color, they won't mix well. So water is bright yellow, and down here toluene is bright blue. And so uh, those colors are drastically different. That kind of implies that they're not going to mix. There's a few points right on the... The D-axis, yes. And those would be hexane... Uh, okay, ALH, that's, a, that's an abbreviation from industry. So you can buy sort of a, a distillation cut... Uh, from a refinery or from a you know a solvent manufacturer, and it's just aliphatic hydrocarbons. So ALH is just aliphatic hydrocarbons, and you can imagine that that would be cheap to buy because they don't really know. I mean, yeah, they might know. They may have run a, a GC on it, but they don't really care what the relative amounts of hexane to pentane are. And so you notice it's a little bit lower in dispersion than hexane, so it's got some lighter fractions in it. Probably has some pentane in it. No hydrogen bonding and no polarity. Yeah, no polarity, no hydrogen bonding. And then even a little further, decane's longer hydrocarbon chain than hexane, so it's a little bit more dispersive. It's got that flexibility, more flexibility in the molecule, and so it's going to be a little higher on the dispersion axis. And then you see over here, uh, see if I can use the pen. I think I can zoom in on these. 
But let's me, I think the next one, I zoom in a little bit. So there's water, the alcohols here. The, uh, this is a um, oil and gas term, oxygenates, sort of, sort of a category of hydrocarbon molecules that have been oxidized to some degree. So those are aldehydes, ketones. Um, we don't really have any acids on here, but um, the esters, anything like that. And then down here, the hydrocarbons. And so zooming in, you see here decane and hexane down at the bottom. Uh, notice toluene. So my pen isn't working. Yeah, here it is. So here's hexane, here's decane, and then toluene is up and over a little bit. So it's just slightly polar and slightly hydrogen bonding, but not much compared to water naturally. Okay. Well, what are these H71DEs and HFE71s? These are some new solvents that are produced by. Um, by 3M, and they have, uh, it's, a, it's an ether solvent, and on one end of the ether, all of the carbons have fluorines on them. So there's a perfluoral fluoro piece, there's an oxygen, and then there's like a methoxy. So the methoxy piece or the ethoxy piece hooked to a perfluoral piece. Uh, the, the fluorinated piece makes them non-flammable. And so these, this was an attempt to make solvents that are non-flammable, that are still useful um, uh, in things like vapor degreasing. Okay. And we have N-methylperolidone, we have DMSO. Notice acetonitrile is an amazing solvent. It's up here in the back. Um, it's incredibly polar, but not very hydrogen bonding. So if you wanted a solvent that was very polar, but aprotic, doesn't hydrogen bond, acetonitrile would be the best choice. It's very polar, but doesn't hydrogen bond much. So if you're ever trying to do a reaction where you're trying to separate, is this a hydrogen bonding issue or just a polarity issue, acetonitrile versus an alcohol would be a great way to test that. An alcohol would be very protic, and an acetonitrile would be just very polar. So another thing that we can do with these Hansen solubility parameters is that we can predict the behavior of blends. And this is a huge huge advantage to Hansen solubility parameters. So what I've got here is a substance that has a certain, it's got a circle around it. That's, that's sort of an interaction area. Let's say that that's a solute, a polymer, a grease, some substance that you want to dissolve. And if you're inside that circle, you can dissolve it. And if you're outside that circle, you can't. So toluene would not dissolve this substance. Acetonitrile would not dissolve this substance. But if you've got a 50-50 mixture of those two, it would be inside the sphere and it would dissolve the substance. So you can predict what the blends will do. And that's probably the best use of the Hansen solubility parameters is predicting what the blends will do. I had a person call me uh, from the international, no, the, no, it was the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And he said he didn't understand his gasoline blends. Because when they had pure ethanol, or like 95% ethanol, this gasket, that was a test gasket for their motor, was fine. And if it was pure gasoline, maybe up to 15% ethanol uh, in gasoline, the gasket was fine. But between 15% and 85% ethanol, uh, the gasket fell apart. With the Hansen solubility parameters, I know exactly what's happening. That gasket material is in between ethanol and gasoline. And when that ethanol is added to gasoline, the blend starts moving up in hydrogen bonding axis. And it moves into the interaction zone of that gasket and causes that polymer gasket to just unwind and fall apart. And so not only are you worried about solubility in this, you can also avoid solubility. You don't want to dissolve the gaskets in an engine. And so if you look at some of the formulations, that's why they have E85 and they don't have E50. <laughs> okay, so this can kind of govern some of the parameters for the fluids that you use using the Hansen solubility parameters. So looking at this same thing from the side, you can see that we could calculate the distance of that substance from you know, this radius, this interaction zone. We can calculate the distance from that substance to toluene and the distance from that substance to acetonitrile. And just using our Cartesian space, we can calculate all those distances and we can use this value. Now, 
One thing that's peculiar about the Henson solubility parameters is that the dispersion axis seems to be twice as important, has twice an effect. And so they put a two in there. And notice in this distance, uh, this, this whole plot back here, if you'll notice, has been plotted by two times the dispersion term. And so our DP and H values, the D term has been multiplied by two. Uh, what that gives us in this plot is that the interaction zone would be a sphere. If we just plotted it by the D axis, the sphere would be squished in the D direction and it would look like a jelly donut. <laughs> okay. So kind of a flat sphere. Uh, but we wanted that interaction to be spherical and so we, we took in this sort of factor of two dependence upon the uh, dispersion term. Are we really out of time? No. Okay, good, thank you. And so, so if we're plotting things with that, that d axis multiplied by two for all those values, then this interaction is a sphere, and we can use sort of the Cartesian distance or the Euclidean distance between these points. In other words, the difference is squared. Add them together and take the square root. So this is the difference between d1 and the substance, uh, p1 in the substance and h1 in the substance. And you square those differences, add them together, and take the square root, and that is this RA term, the difference in cohesive, in cohesive energy density. Uh, so um, I've called this, and even asked Dr. Hansen if he approved, I call this the Hansen distance. <laughs> yeah. He approved. He thought that was nice. Okay, because it's not the Euclidean distance because there's that 2 D2 term in there. And so if you plot it the way he said to plot it in his thesis with this twice dependence upon the dispersion term, then you take into account, and that makes this slightly different um, than just taking the Euclidean distance of the D term by itself. It's the 2 D term, that, that factor of 2, which when you square it comes out as a factor of 4. So you'll hear people talk about the factor of 4 term or the factor of 2. Those are the same. It just depends upon whether you've squared it or not. Okay. Now notice the blend. We could walk along, if we start with pure acetonitrile and start to blend in toluene, we're going to move along this, this line. And at this point, we enter the solubility sphere, and we have a good probability that that substance will, will dissolve in this range of blends. And so we could calculate when that RA value gets within that R0 value. So if RA is less than R0, then we have a good chance of it dissolving, or at least strongly interacting. What is strongly interacting? Think about a polymer. You may not get something that weighs 500,000 Daltons in the solution, but where's that solvent gonna go if it's inside the R R0 of that solvent, of that polymer? It's gonna go into the polymer and swell it. So when we say strongly interacting, we may not mean dissolving. It may not be able to get it into solution, but it may swell that polymer. And it, sometimes you want that to happen. If you're trying to remove a polymer from a surface, you swell it, it'll unlatch from the surface. And you can remove it. Now, if you want that polymer to stay on the surface, you want to avoid this region because you don't want your solvent to get in there and cause your polymer to swell or change dimension. This is also called stress cracking. If you get solvent in one part of a polymer and not in another, the part that swells, will create stress regions between the part that didn't swell and it'll crack. I got another call from a fellow who was installing solar cells at the, in California and he said whenever he made his plastic junction boxes for wiring up the solar cells and they glued them to the back of the solar cells, his junction boxes fell apart. Like they just broke in half. The back came off. And I said what you've got is the solvent in that adhesive that they're using to glue on is not compatible with your plastic junction box. And so you've got to change that adhesive or you're, 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 you know, you're going to lose the contract essentially because they thought it was a problem with his junction boxes. But they need to do some testing to see which adhesive was strong enough to hold it on those junction boxes for a long time but not also have a solvent that would swell his polymer and bust the junction box into pieces. How is R so I know it's a variable. Yes. You can, you can change it, but how do you determine what? That's why Tanner's here. He's doing this research right now on different substances and oils and greases and so on, and, and it's empirically determined. 
So you do interactions. So if you take uh, polymers, like I had to remove polymers from metal surface for a, comp for a co client, and they wanted me to glue these epoxies and celastics onto these metal coupons and age them in the oven at 60 degrees C, a certain humidity, for three months, and then try to remove the polymer. And so we took cured polymer and cut it into little bits, or we cured it in like straws, soda straws, and then peeled the straws off. So we had these little polymer pellets. And we put one pellet in each vial for like 30 vials, and then put a different solvent in each vial. And so we had the same polymer, different solvents, and we took photographs every 30 minutes. And after a couple of hours, we saw some polymers swell and some polymers not swell. So then we look in here, we find the polymers that swell, and sure enough, they're in a certain region. And so we draw that sphere around the solvents that swelled that polymer. And now we know the solubility sphere or interaction sphere for that polymer. So it's empirically determined in some way. And that's the trick, is trying to figure out an experiment that can help you determine what a good solvent and a bad solvent is. So that R0 comes from an experiment. Uh, we do most of ours photographically. We put grease in the bottom, we put solvents on there, we see which greases dissolve. And so that we can find the interacting solvents for the greases. But we did pigments, we tried carbon black. It was very difficult to see the difference between a dispersed powder and a non-dispersed powder, but that's another way that I've heard that it can be done. So again, sort of exposure experiments and trying to find the good solvents and the bad solvents. So it just comes to a point though that you have to determine, because you right. can make that R sub O. Yeah, you can blow it and up. There's a chance, depending on what your substance is, that it may have a big. Yeah, there is a chance that it might interact with a lot of different things. And you might have parts of your molecule, like if it's a really big molecule, you might have some polar groups, like think of a surfactant, a polar group that's going to interact with the hydrogen bonders and the, and the polar compounds, and then the oily part. And so, uh, you know, you may have a complex, it may not just be a perfect sphere. Sometimes you get two spheres, depending on the complexity of the substance. So this allows us to blend these solvents and interact with this. So we wrote software. I had a student come uh, who was a computer science uh, interested student. He ended, ended up leaving chemistry and he graduated with chemistry bachelor's and went and got his master's in computer science. Uh, he helped us write some code that does this. It goes through every possible combination of solvents and looks at their two uh, binary components to see if that line cuts through the sphere. So he wrote the software to search through a list of solvents and cut, look at every binary combination. Okay, And if you have a hundred solvents, a list of a hundred solvents, and you want to do a two component or three component, you can see if this triangle goes through the sphere, or four component, if you want to see if this object contains the center of that sphere, if you want to look at th two, three, and four component blends of just a hundred solvents, there's 12 million recipes. There's no way to do this trial and error. You can't just start on your solvent shelf and say, I'll try one with two, one with three, one with four. If you have 100 solvents, and I have way more than 100 solvents in my lab, it, there's 12 million combinations that would give me a recipe for that substance. You know? So I need a way to filter that list. So we wrote software that filters that list and can give me the most promising two, three, and four component blends for a particular substance if I know the Hansen solubility parameter target. So if I know that substance's target, then I can predict the blends to either attack it or I can predict the blends to leave it alone. So if I know these blends are problematic, they're going to dissolve this gasket or interfere with this junction box, I can't use those blends in my adhesive formulation or my gasoline. And so you can come up with these blend desirability ratings and it'll produce these and we can look at them in Excel and you can use conditional formatting to find the, the, you know, the good ones, the green ones, the bad ones, the red ones. You can put in here also flammability. You can put in toxicity. So you can have a desirability rating. Let's say you've got the best blend in the world, but it's hexamethyl death you know, and water. <laughs> and you probably don't want to use that with your workers, okay? Even though it would be great, okay? It's probably not going to work you know, for your for your workers, and so you probably don't want to use that one. So you can filter the list based upon that. And so these methods were, have been produced. I got the cover article one time on 
on uh, controlled environments, solving a solvent substitution puzzle. And so that's just an analyzing these blends and producing uh, this, this work. So then there was an application by Solvay. And, and so the point is you can go and, and do uh, trial and error. And so you've heard this, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And an ounce of theory is worth a pound of trial and error. Okay, if you've got a model that can filter that 12 million possibility list down to a few that you can then go into the lab and do, then it's worth looking at that. And the other way to say that 12 months of experimentation can save you two months in the library. Right? And so that's why we always emphasize literature searches. Because you can go to the lab, you can start mixing things, and 12 months later you're like, gee, I don't really understand my results. Um, I think I found something that works, and you go to the literature and you find a paper that says this would work. You just wasted 12 months of work because you could have gone to the literature and found that the paper would have guided you all the way to the end point and would have told you what you spent 12 months reinventing, that paper could have gotten you to the end point uh, much sooner. And so this is, uh, again, the Solvay Lab, the Welch Foundation Developmental Grant has paid for the students to come up with a lot of this research and to generate these Povre images and still continuing to this day. So, are there any questions about this? <laughs> Thank you. Any questions on this? Uh, that was a really good question about how you get R0. Like I said, we do it photographically most of the time. I'm working with this lab and I'm, I'm just, there's one, I'm, I'm Several lectures ahead that I want to get to. Okay, so yeah, that, so this was the just introduction to the solubility parameters, and and if these are going to be again these videos will be posted. The next video will be on how you determine that solubility sphere. So we'll actually get into different methods for solving that solubility sphere. We've used it for surfaces, so we'll talk in the next slide, uh, lecture about using contact angle. So. Uh, using different solvents, putting them a drop of solvent on the surface to see how it flattens out. If it flattens out on that substance, then let's say you're doing paint. I've got a video online where I analyze an old oxidized paint. So it's an old table that my wife wanted me to restore. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's been sitting in the barn for maybe 50 years. I mean, a long time. Nothing in a barn gets thrown away. And, and so this is... Who knows, this paint could even be lead-based paint. I don't know what kind of paint this is. And so I just went through with my solvents and looked at the wettability of that paint with the different solvents. And so I put uh, hexane on there and it did a thing. And then I put acetone on there and alcohols and, and all the different solvents that you saw, NMP. And the ones that interacted the most, the ones that flattened out the most, were most similar to that paint. And so it didn't matter what the original paint was. I'm dealing with paint that's been sitting in a barn for 50 years and is oxidized. And rust is coming through from the, from the metal underneath. And so even if I knew what the original paint was, uh, the paint now, after 50 years of oxygen attack and light and heat, may have a totally different chemistry. So I wanted to find out the current chemistry using the solubility parameters. And then I did. I found a blend, and, and I made that blend and then strip the paint off with that blend. And that's all in that video. Um, and I compared it to lacquer thinner, which you can buy at the hardware store, and my blend did better than the lacquer thinner. Lacquer thinner was good. That stuff will really dissolve well. Use it in a hood or use it with a respirator. Uh, it will make you woozy. Um, but, but my blend was better performing on that particular oxidized paint. So that's what we'll look at next time. Not that particular application, but how we determine the, the RO value. We can do it for solutes as well. So you can look at how many drops of a solvent it takes to make a homogeneous solution. So if you have an organic substance, you're trying to find what its solubility parameters are. You can weigh out a certain amount in the different vials. So you've got vials full of these substances, and then you put a different solvent in, and you just count drops. Put one drop in there two drops, three drops, and you, you know, if, if that is not soluble, you'll see the solution above and then the crystals in the bottom, and that's no interaction. But if you put three or four drops in there and it's homogeneous automatically, you know, already, then you know that's a strong interaction. In fact, it's kind of strange, a solute solvent, uh, we put three drops of DMSO in nitroaniline, 
and there was more nitroaniline on a mole basis than the DMSO. And yet it was a homogeneous solution. So that, that, think about that. This, there's less solvent than solute. So what's the solvent in that case? Is the nitroaniline the solvent and DMSO the solute? Because DMSO is less concentrated than the nitroaniline. Anyway, that doesn't bother y'all. It bothers me, you know, because we typically think the solute is the solid substance that we started with and we add the solvent and it goes homogeneous. But in this case, at three or four drops of DMSO, I had a homogeneous solution. But there's more nitroaniline in it than the solvent. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? It's a little weird, isn't it? Yeah. If I got a spoon and scooped it out and analyzed the molecules, I'd have more molecules of nitroaniline than DMSO. But my mind thinks of DMSO as the solvent. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So. <laughs>